Today, we will be reviewing the current state of every Nintendo franchise. Now, Nintendo has a ton of franchises. If you were to count all the subseries separately, you'd end up with a mind-boggling 360 franchises in total. Now, if you were to look at the recent releases, even just within the last five years, you'd notice very quickly that there are nowhere near that many franchises being released. So the question then becomes, well, what happened to all of them then? And that is what we're going to be figuring out by the end of this video. Now, to save me some sanity and you guys some time, there were some criteria that I set so that I wouldn't be publishing this video on my deathbed. Firstly, I will only be looking at franchises that include multiple games in the series. So this means there's going to be no one-hit wonders, or I guess in this case, they'd be one-hit fails. As I take it, they probably didn't sell too well if they were never followed up on. Secondly, only franchises that have been released in the West will be included. As for sub-branches of franchises, depending on the number of games or the size of the franchise itself, I'll either choose to combine it with their main franchise or separate them completely. I will also place each franchise into one of five tiers, which I've labeled flagships, which are just the main Nintendo franchises that sell well no matter what, mainstays, which are franchises that release regularly enough and do well, they exist, which is just a tier that I created for franchises that pop up every now and then, live support, which are just games that are in desperate need of some divine intervention, and then just straight up dead franchises that pretty much have no hope of ever being revived. Now with all of that out of the way, let's begin. So not including the numerous single release arcade games, the first ever Nintendo franchise actually happens to be Donkey Kong, first conceptualized by Miyamoto in 1981. Now I'm guessing most of you know the iconic game where you play as Mario and have to get to the top by avoiding barrels thrown by Donkey Kong. The game was an instant success in arcades and spawned the addition of numerous sequels in the form of Donkey Kong Jr., Donkey Kong 3, and Donkey Kong Jungle Fever. The franchise would also branch off into sub-series such as Donkey Kong Country, Mario vs Donkey Kong, Donkey Konga, and DK King of Swing. Donkey Kong was thriving in the early 2000s, with games being released usually within a few years of each other at most. Recently, however, we have experienced a Donkey Kong drought, with the latest game being a remake of Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze for the Switch. Because of this, I think the Donkey Kong franchise at this current moment, as much as I hate to say it, belongs in the they exist here. You could argue that it belongs in the mainstays just for what it's done for Nintendo in general, but I'm looking at it as current. Now following Donkey Kong, we have a fairly unknown franchise going by the name of Mario. Now I'm not sure if you guys have actually heard about this franchise before, but apparently Okay, with all joking aside, if you were to pick one franchise to encompass Nintendo, this would probably be the one. After his initial appearance in Donkey Kong, Mario would make his first appearance in his own franchise in Mario Bros, released in 1983. Two years later, Mario would not only strike gold, but single-handedly revive the whole video game industry with his return in Super Mario Bros for the NES. To date, this game alone has sold over 40 million copies. To help put that into perspective, that's about two times the total sales of the whole Metroid franchise. As a result, Mario was split off to do many things, making up a total of 14 different franchises, as well as numerous spin-offs as well. Super Mario Bros is the first game among the Super Mario subseries, which in my opinion includes every game that has the word Super Mario in its title. So we're talking Super Mario Maker and New Super Mario Bros, all of those are included and is made up of 32 games, including remakes and remasters. The franchise has seen consistent releases since Super Mario Bros. in 1985, up to recent years with Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury in 2021. Honestly, I'm not even sure why I'm still talking about this. It's probably one of the easiest Nintendo franchises to place. Life support. What? Now, if you thought Wii Sports was the premier sports franchise, well, you must have never played NES Sports. Uh, to be honest, I'm not even sure if this counts as a franchise, but it was a series of games released on the NES from 1983 to 1988. It would include anything from baseball to ice hockey, but Nintendo cancelled the series in 1988, so the franchise is just dead. Anyway, the next franchise to be released was Punch-Out, making its first appearance in arcades in 1984. The game, as you'd expect, has you boxing, but in a more puzzle-like manner where you predict and counter the enemy's movements. A further seven games would be released for the franchise, ending with Punch-Out for the Wii in 2009. Since then, however, there hasn't been as much as a whisper regarding the franchise. The Punch-Out franchise to this day has a very dedicated player base, with speedrunners pushing the absolute boundaries possible. The fact that it's been MIA for over a decade, however, most likely means that Nintendo, at least for the moment, has no plans of bringing it back. Later on into 1984, Nintendo would release Excite Bike, which would mark the first entry into the Excite franchise. While initially only involving the use of motorcycles, the vehicle choice would branch out with the release of Excite Truck for the Wii in 2006. While the gameplay differs vastly between each game, 
The one common goal is to be in completely insane. The game might as well have been called Crashing Simulator, with the latest game being Excitebike World Rally, which was released for the Wii in 2009, it's probably safe to say that this series is bordering on just being completely dead, or at least on its last breaths in life support. Now alongside Mario as one of Nintendo's most recognised franchise, we have The Legend of Zelda. First released all the way back in 1986 for the NES, Link, Zelda and Ganon's story has been portrayed through 19 mainline games that have spanned every single major Nintendo console. With total sales well over 100 million, and Tears of the Kingdom looking to release this year, it would be a waste to discuss this any further regarding the current state it's in. The Legend of Zelda is one of Nintendo's flagship franchises, and will most likely stay that way forever. Now let's just say that gamers in 1986 were eating real good, because just 6 months after the release of The Legend of Zelda, another franchise was looking to make a name for itself. That franchise was Metroid. First released in 1986 with the original Metroid for the NES, the franchise has gone on to release 16 games in total, all of which have been consistently stellar, give or take maybe one or two. While suffering from large periods of time without new releases, the franchise has managed to stay relevant and even revive itself in recent years to the point where it's become one of the most requested and exciting franchises in the current day. The franchise at this point deserves to be a Nintendo mainstay and could possibly see itself becoming a flagship series in the near future if it continues on its current trajectory. Following back-to-back -back legendary franchises, could Nintendo make it a hat-trick? No, they couldn't. Because the next franchise released happened to be Kid Icarus. Taking place in Angel Land, the game follows Pit, an angel and guardian to the goddess of light, Palutena, who battles against the forces of evil in the form of Medusa. It's ironic that Pit is an angel, meanwhile his franchise more so embodies that of a fallen angel. Initially released in 1987 for the NES, the game would receive mixed reviews before having a sequel released for it in 1991 called Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters. All signs pointed to the franchise taking off like an angel. <laughs> Get it? Well, what if I told you that this was the last Kid Icarus game for 21 years? Now Pet made his grand return in his new game- Wait what? Oh. Well, he was added to Smash, which will become pretty commonplace the more franchises we review. But Pitt did eventually make a return in Kid Icarus Uprising in 2012 for the 3DS, making it the first time the franchise had seen a 3D world. Even after selling decently well and being praised for its gameplay, the franchise has yet to see another game for over 10 years. It was revived just to be wheeled back into life support. Now after a long span of one-hit wonders like Duck Hunt, the next Nintendo franchise would be Nintendo Wars, a series of turn-based strategy games where you move each of your allies' units across the battlefield to attack your enemies. Beginning in 1988 with the release of Famicom Wars, the series would see moderate success, releasing 12 games over a 20 year period, until Advance Wars Days of Ruin in 2008 for the Nintendo DS. The franchise would soon be wheeled into hospital for life support, before being revived very recently with its reboots of Advance Wars 1 and 2, looking to release this year. Honestly, I'm not sure if this is enough to take it off life support, but I think because it's two games in one, it's done enough to move up to the they exist tier for now. We now arrive at the first franchise to have two names, formerly known as Mother in Japan before being renamed to Earthbound for its western release. The role playing games often featured a little boy and his group of friends defeating aliens with their supernatural powers. The franchise got its start with Earthbound Beginnings, or Mother as they called it in Japan, in 1989 for the NES. Now technically only one of three games was ever released in the west, that being the titular game Earthbound in 1995. Both Mother 3, the sequel, as well as Mother 1 plus 2 would remain Japanese exclusive releases. Seeing as the game only ever released one game in the West, and even including the Japanese releases, the franchise has not seen a game since 2006. The only remembrance of the franchise at this point is Ness's inclusion in Smash Bros. The franchise as a result is on heavy life support but it may just be completely dead at this point. The franchise with the most recent release takes up the next spot. Honestly, I would have never imagined Nintendo to partner up with Colgate for one of their releases, but here we are. Now all jokes aside, Fire Emblem has become one of Nintendo's longest running franchises. Starting off with Fire Emblem, Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light in 1990, thank god they've started shortening the names of these games. Up until the most recent Fire Emblem, which was Fire Emblem Engage, the franchise spans over 30 years, with 17 mainline games to its name. The game initially caught the attention of players due to its challenging turn-based RPG elements, as well as its permadeath mechanic. Now here's a fun fact, the franchise would actually release 6 games before ever appearing in the West. 
Following the addition of Marth and Roy in the Super Smash Bros melee roster, and people realising that Marth was at least a high A tier character, if not S tier, Nintendo decided to finally bring the franchise over in 2003, with Fire Emblem, The Blazing Blade. The franchise has seen consistent releases up until this day, solidifying itself as a Nintendo mainstay. Now, this is a franchise I didn't even know existed before researching for this video. Released in North America only in 1990, the game would receive a port to the Game Boy and a sequel titled Super Play Action Football in 1992. Now, some of you are probably wondering, you know, why the hell I even included this, and it's obvious that this franchise is just straight up dead. But I mean, I wasn't kidding when I said I would include, well, kind of almost all Nintendo franchises, as long as they fit the criteria I set out. Now often regarded as a forgotten classic, the Star Tropics franchise featured two games to its name in the form of the original in 1990, as well as a sequel called Zoda's Revenge Star Tropics 2. Unfortunately, the game would never expand past this, despite players praising the game for its fun gameplay and catchy music. The fact that the sequel was released on the NES, even after the SNES had already come out, is often cited as one of the main reasons the franchise never took off. As a result, the franchise cannot even be put on life support at this stage. Ah, F-Zero, the sci-fi racing franchise that predates even Mario Kart, first being released in 1990 for the SNES. Often considered one of the hardest racing franchises of all time due to its intense speed and tight turns, the franchise would go on to release 9 games over the course of 14 years. Now that sounds amazing, right? Well, the franchise has yet to see a new game since F-Zero Climax for the Game Boy Advance in 2004. Once again, the game's titular character, Captain Falcon, has been relegated to a roster spot on Super Smash Bros. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. The franchise is not even really on life support at this point, and it's hard to say if Nintendo has any plans to ever bring this beloved series back. From a racing franchise to a flying franchise, next up is Pilot Wings. And if you've never heard of this one, then don't worry, because neither had I. From what I can tell, it's just a series of flight simulation games. First released for the SNES in 1990, the franchise spans three games total. What's surprising is the latest game, Pilot Wings Resort, was actually released for the 3DS in 2011, meaning that this franchise is more current and alive than others like F-Zero or Punch-Out. Still though, I can't see this franchise getting a new game anytime soon, if ever. Now in the 9 years since his first appearance, Mario had gotten a PhD and finished studying medicine, before becoming a doctor on the NES in 1990. The game was pretty much just a ripoff of Tetris, but because it was Mario, it did decently well. The franchise would include another 7 installments, with the latest being Dr. Mario World, a mobile game released in 2019. Honestly, this franchise just feels like a quick ripoff of Mario and Tetris, and most likely only exists to cash in on another facet of him. I guess it deserves to be in the exists tier though, as it's still receiving new games to this day. We now have our first spin-off franchise from the original Mario franchise. The Yoshi franchise features a total of 8 games, starting with Yoshi in 1991 for the NES and Game Boy. Mainly consisting of a combination of puzzle and platformer games, the franchise has had significant breaks in between sets of games. Within the last decade, however, there have been 3 mainline games for the franchise, and while it may not have the star power to be a Nintendo mainstay, as of right now, it certainly isn't on life support. The lovable pink blob is up next, making his grand entrance in Kirby's Dream Land for the Game Game Boy in 1992. Over the last 20 years, the franchise has seen over 20 games released, meaning that in some cases there were multiple Kirby games released within the same year. The latest to be released, which is ironic considering the first game's title, is Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe in 2023. Having sold well over 40 million copies, and ranking it as one of the top 50 best-selling video game franchises of all time, paired with its consistent release cycle, Kirby easily manages to take a spot as one of Nintendo's mainstay franchises. Now here's a fun fact, it took Mario over 10 years to pass his driving exam. Well, at least that's how long it took for him to get into a cart and start racing around Nintendo-inspired courses. Released in 1992 for the SNES, Super Mario Kart would prove to be an instant success, selling well over 8 million copies in its lifetime, introducing the addicting gameplay of absolute Mayhem, and the idea that it doesn't matter how terrible you are because RNG and items can carry you to first place regardless, the franchise would spawn 15 games in total, covering pretty much every Nintendo console and more. The latest addition to the series was Mario Kart Live Home Circuit in 2020, but before that was the release of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe for the Switch, which also holds the record for the best-selling Nintendo game if you were to not include Wii Sports. Mario Kart games are often within the top 3 bestsellers on each respective console, and their consistent releases make for a 
very good argument for them being a Nintendo flagship. I think because it's a sub-series of Mario, it can't quite reach that spot, but in the future, it may do so much that it's inevitable. For now, I consider it a Nintendo mainstay. Now we have another one of these obscure entries at this point, titled Battle Clash, released for the SNES in 1992. The game was a light gun shooter, involving the player taking control of a gunner in a mecha suit and fighting other mechas in one-on-one -on -one battles. The game was followed up a year later with the release of Metal Combat Falcon's Revenge. Since then, there's been nothing though, allowing us to add it to the pile of dead franchises. So by this point, we've had a racing franchise, we've had a flying franchise, well, how about a jet skiing franchise? Wave Race crashed onto the scene in 1992 for the Game Boy. Featuring two game modes, Slalom and Circuit, the initial impressions were positive and resulted in the production of two sequels, Wave Race 64 for the N64 and the latest game, Wave Race Blue Storm for the Nintendo GameCube. Unfortunately, this latest game was released all the way back in 2001. There have been mentions of interest in reviving the series, but going on 20 years without a game does not bode well for any fans still holding on to what little hope is left. Because of the expressed interest by Nintendo though, it can just hold off in the life support tier. We've arrived at what I consider to be one of the most underutilized gaming franchises ever. Star Fox was first released as far back as 1993 for the SNES and saw monumental success. It followed up with the release of Star Fox 64, which became the best selling game of the franchise. At this point, Star Fox was on its way to becoming another household name in Nintendo's collection. Fast forward 20 years and, well, Star Fox 64 still remains the best-selling game in the franchise, and by a significant amount. Nintendo's lack of creativity showed in their decisions to outsource the future Star Fox games to other teams, and as a result, the franchise has never been able to find its true identity. The most recent entry, Star Fox Zero, which was released in 2016 for the Wii U, also holds the record for the lowest sales out of the whole franchise. While often considered one of Nintendo's major franchises, the current state it's in couldn't be worse and as such, it belongs in the life support tier. Now, if you guys have made it this far, then I applaud you. I would also ask that you consider hitting that subscribe button if you're enjoying the video. Now onto the next franchise, which happens to be Wario. Making his first appearance all the way back in 1992 in Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins, Wario would have to wait two years before hijacking Super Mario Land and turning it into Wario Land 1994. Over the course of six Wario Land games, spanning from 1994 to 2008, the player would play as Wario with the sole goal of becoming rich from collecting treasures. Much like the Mario games it was based on, Wario Land featured platforming elements over a series of worlds that each had a set of levels. While these games fared well and were received positively, the popularity of Wario would explode upon the release of the WarioWare games. Being released in 2003 for the Game Boy Advance, WarioWare Inc. Mega Microgame featured what is known as microgames. Go figure. Short 3 to 5 second instances where should the player fail, they lose a life. The game would throw numerous games at the player in quick succession. The series would perform decently well, resulting in 9 total games spanning over most of Nintendo's major consoles, with the latest release being released on the Switch in recent years. As a whole, I believe the Warrior franchise, while being a niche one, has remained consistent enough to stay as a mainstay. I would say that if we were to separate Warrior Land, which has been MIA since 2008, it would most likely be a dead franchise at this point, or at least on live support. Next up, we have Picross. And I'm gonna be honest, I don't actually know anyone that's played this series of games. But considering that it's still being released to this day in the form of Picross S7 for the Switch in 2022, there must be at least one person out there grinding these games. The games are Momogram puzzle games, which if you're unsure of what those are, the goal is to essentially reveal a hidden picture on a grid by scraping away specific squares of it. Certain numbers are given on the sides of each row and column that let the player know how many squares are required to be scrapped. Honestly, these games are released pretty much every year, so guess it's got to be a flagship franchise. Yeah, sorry, no chance. For those that love these games, I'm sorry, but there's just no way I'm putting it up there with these other iconic franchises. Now, Nintendo must really love puzzle games, or maybe they were just easier to create back in the day, because just six months after the release of Picross, Nintendo would start a new series known as Panel de Pon, or Puzzle League. Now, for the seven people who know this franchise, I'm afraid to tell you that it's most likely dead. Featuring 10 games over the course of 14 years from 1995 to 2009, the series focused on puzzle-like games similar in a sense to Tetris. There's not too much else to say about this franchise, as it's been forgotten by Nintendo. 
Now I'm just going to quickly shoot through the countless Mario sports games during this section because honestly there's just so many of them to cover separately. So starting off with Mario Tennis released in 1995 for the Virtual Boy, the gameplay as you'd expect is pretty much just tennis, like think Wii Sports Tennis but with Mario characters and special abilities. The franchise actually includes 8 games on all major consoles but I think the niche is too specific and therefore belongs in the it exists here. Now after winning a few Grand Slams, Mario made his way over to Golf in 1999 where he looked to win some PGA Tours. Over the course of 6 games, with the latest being Mario Golf Super Rush released in 2021 for the Switch, Mario established himself as Tiger Woods' equal, before looking towards baseball. Now Mario turned pro in 2005 on the GameCube in Mario Superstar Baseball. I guess baseball wasn't really a sport though, as he retired in 2008, following Mario Super Sluggers for the Wii. Now after casually beating Lionel Messi in a 1-on-1, -on -one, Mario decided to try his hand at football, or soccer for you Americans. He would make his first appearance in in Super Mario Strikers in 2005 for the GameCube. After making his return in 2007 in Mario Strikers Charged for the Wii, Mario would retire to focus on exploring the galaxy. Don't worry though, as he's returned to play recently in Mario Strikers Battle League, released for the Switch in 2022. Now honestly, I don't think there's enough Mario sports games at this point, but if there's one thing they all have in common, it's that they're all just alright. Nothing super special and mainly just spin-offs to play every now and then. Now there's always been this debate going on if Pokemon really is a Nintendo franchise, seeing as it's jointly owned by Game Freak, Nintendo and Creatures Inc, but it would feel weird not to include it on such a list. Pokemon as a whole probably needs no introduction. From the games, to the trading cards, to the anime show, Pokemon is probably the most recognised franchise aside from Mario. The first games to be released were Pokemon Red and Green for the Game Boy in 1996 or as they were known in the West, Pokemon Red and Blue, which were released two years later in 1998. Featuring 151 different Pokemon to catch, the role-playing game would take over and never look back. The addictive gameplay and the goal to catch them all while becoming the best Pokemon trainer kept fans coming back for more. To this day, 23 mainline games have been released for the franchise. If you were to count spin-off games, that number would jump to a staggering 65 games. And as it would take a whole day just to list off each, I will quickly be mentioning the bigger subseries and where they would place in this list. Pokemon Mystery Dungeon has fairly consistent releases for the handheld consoles, and honestly, out of all the subseries, most deserves a spot in mainstays. Pokemon Snap was released in 1999 and didn't receive a sequel until 2021. Most likely, we'll have to wait that long for another game, so it's probably on life support. Pokemon Stadium never made it off the N64, so it's dead. Pokemon Tournament got an enhanced port for the Switch in 2017, but outside of that, it's grass at straws, life support. Pokemon Ranger is my personal favourite forgotten series. After releasing 3 games from 2006 to 2010 and selling decently well, it was never touched by Nintendo again, so unfortunately it's most likely dead as well. Overall though, Pokemon easily secures a spot as one of Nintendo's flagship franchises, even if people don't want to consider it a Nintendo franchise in the first place. Now the pinnacle of snowboarding was upon us in 1998, with the release of 1080 snowboarding. Including a stacked roster of 5 characters and the choice of 6 raceable tracks, the game would go on to receive critical acclaim for its magnificent graphics and its ability to emulate the feeling and atmosphere of snowboarding, all while sitting in your mum's basement. This would result in the game selling over 2 million copies and warranting a sequel to 1080 Snowboarding Avalanche, which would release in 2003 for the GameCube. Unfortunately, this game would not receive the same love as the original, with many pointing out the frame rate issues and the limited gameplay. Seeing as I can't find the official sales numbers of this game, it's probably safe to assume that the reason why this was the last entry is due to the underperformance of the game. It's a shame considering how good the original game was though, and it's most likely a dead franchise at this point. Next up is a franchise that might have had the most unique naming convention out of all of Nintendo's franchise. What franchise is that, I hear you asking? Well obviously I'm talking about Mario Party. Now first introduced in the West in 1999, the games involved Mario and friends travelling around a game board collecting stars which could be bought using the coins earned from winning various minigames. Each game featured different boards which all included different features and surprises to enjoy. Fun fact, Mario Party currently holds the record for the longest running minigame series in video game history. Over the course of 25 years, the 18 games associated with the franchise have sold over 69 million total copies. When you think of Nintendo Party games, this franchise is almost always the first considered, and as a result, deserves a spot as a Nintendo mainstay. Super Smash Bros, or better yet, the haven for characters of dead franchises, was released in 1999 for the N64. Looking to challenge the Avengers for the greatest crossover of characters ever, the original Super Smash Bros featured 12 characters ranging from Samus to Ness. Crazy to think there are now 82 fighters to choose from in Ultimate. The goal of the game? To smash each other. Ah, uh, I mean... 
fight each other until you can knock them off the stage. The idea of Nintendo's iconic characters beating the shit out of each other was amazing and it has resulted in the franchise becoming one of the best selling series to date. With releases on every major Nintendo home console since the N64, the franchise has become one of the most recognised even outside of Nintendo. It's gotten so big that characters outside of Nintendo franchises have somehow found their way in. In some cases, just having fighters in the game has helped boost popularity and helped push for the revival of certain series. While not quite on the same level as Nintendo's flagships, it easily secures its spot as a Nintendo mainstay. I hope you guys aren't sick of Mario yet, because he's back, and this time, not in 3D. Well. I mean, he, he is kind of in 3D, but not really. Paper Mario reverted Mario back to his 2D origins as a paper cutout while having him move around in a 3D world. The first installment of the series was released in 2000 for the N64, with five sequels following. These games have always been quite niche, but have managed to grow a dedicated fan base. The games have been released consistently every few years, with the most recent being Paper Mario and Origami King in 2020 for the Switch. I think some of you may not agree, but I consider it a mainstay, just based on the consistency and the apparent insistence on keeping the franchise alive by Nintendo. Sin and Punishment was a third-person rail shooter released in 2000 for the N64. The game was initially only ever released in Japan, but would later be released on the Virtual Console in 2007. Similar in nature to the Star Fox series, the games differ in that Sin and Punishment took place entirely on foot, as well as the fact that aiming and movement were completely separate, unlike Star Fox. Players could switch between a lock-on gun mode or a manual gun mode, which was considerably more powerful but harder to aim. The game was received positively and resulted in the game getting a sequel for the Wii in 2008, called Sin and Punishment Star Successor. The use of Wii motion controls allowed for aiming by pointing the Wii remote. Nintendo was unsure if they should release the sequel in America, but due to the success's high sales on the virtual console, they decided it best that they try. It seems that while the game was positively nice. reviewed, sales didn't live up to Nintendo's expectations, as we have yet to receive another release in the franchise since. Now before the explosive rise of Animal Crossing New Horizons, the franchise was a relatively modest life simulation series. The games themselves have no end goal, with players being able to do anything they wish within the limits of the game. First released in 2001 for the GameCube, the series spans 9 total games, when including the original Japanese version and spin-offs. While many will attribute the majority of its success to New Horizons, there have been multiple games, specifically Wild World for the DS in 2005 and New Leaf for the 3DS in 2013, which have managed to sell more than 10 10 million copies respectively. The franchise in this regard has been a commercial success and it's impossible to ignore the explosive rise of New Horizons for the Switch in 2020. It is definitely a Nintendo mainstay, but there are arguments to be made for it being a flagship series. Actually, you know what? I think I might actually place it there at this current moment, as I don't see the next Animal Crossing game flopping. Looking to follow in his brother's footsteps, Luigi took a shot at starting up his own franchise. A fan of the Ghostbusters movies? Well, I'm assuming based on the format of his games, Luigi finds himself rich after winning a luxury mansion. The only problem? The mansion is filled with ghosts, and his brother, Mario, has been captured by their king. This offers a nice dichotomy, featuring the clumsy Luigi as the hero. First appearing on the GameCube in 2001 as a launch title, the franchise has released four games up to this day. The franchise has managed to stay relevant up until 2019 with the release of Luigi's Mansion 3 for the Switch. The games are a breath of fresh air from the usual platformers his brothers involved in. But the overall lack of games means that this franchise can't rank any higher than it exists. For now. We now arrive at another franchise that has been lost to time. Golden Sun was first released in 2001 exclusively for the Game Boy Advance. Golden Sun was a traditional RPG game and featured many core aspects such as fighting, leveling up characters, moving through the world and completing dungeons. The game would introduce a few new mechanics though, mainly regarding its version of magic, which could be used not only in combat but outside in the world as well. You were able to move objects, read people's minds and even create whirlwinds. The game received critical acclaim on release and is considered one of the best RPG games of its time. This would result in Nintendo releasing two further games, the first being Golden Sun The Lost Age, released in 2003 for the Game Boy Advance, the second Golden Sun Dark Dawn for the DS in 2010. Despite positive reviews all around, the lackluster sales must have told Nintendo that interest in the series was dwindling, and as a result, we haven't received a new game since. Unfortunately, it's bordering on being a dead franchise, but I still have hope for the future. One of the most unique and creative franchises developed and published by Nintendo happens to be Pikmin. Released for the GameCube in 2001, the initial game was unlike anything seen before, and followed the story of Olimar after he is left stranded on an unknown planet following his ship getting hit by a comet and crashing. To help him with his journey, Olimar would recruit the help of Pikmin, small plant-like hybrids that could be used to carry, fight, build, and destroy obstacles. 
The game was received well, and over 20 plus years, the game has released 5 total games. The game, despite its frequent drought periods, is now stronger than ever, and with the release of Pikmin 4 this year, I think it may push itself into mainstay territory. At this very moment though, I think I can only put it in the it exists tier. No, don't do it! The Mario Brothers decided to team up for once in their own franchise. The first adventure would take place on the Game Boy Advance in 2003 in Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. For the most part, the games functioned differently from other role-playing games, as it involved the player controlling both Mario and Luigi simultaneously. This was achieved by having Luigi follow close behind while having buttons mapped separately to each, for A for Mario and B for Luigi, for example. The franchise has remained exclusively on portable devices, with the latest being a remake of Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story, which was released on the 3DS in 2019. Now it's anybody's guess as to whether Nintendo will continue with this franchise, but for now, it exists having amassed over 7 games. If I'm being honest, I was unaware that this game even had a sequel, as I've only ever played the original Nintendogs. The game itself was pretty much like having a dog, while also not having a dog. You could play with them, you could wash them, you could feed them, and even enter them into frisbee throwing competitions, which by the way, pro tip, was the easiest way to make money in that game. The game was a hit with fans, leading to its monumental 24 million sales. Six years later, the game received its sequel in the form of Nintendogs plus Cats for the 3DS. This game sold decently well, but it was nowhere near the levels of its predecessor. Since then, we have yet to see another game. So no, there hasn't been a Nintendogs plus Cats plus Turtles. I know, I'm deeply saddened by this as well. But from the looks of it, we'll probably never get it, as the franchise is most likely dead. Again, we've come to one of those franchises that I'm not even sure if I should have included, but based on the criteria, it fits. Clubhouse Games is a collection of 42 all-time classics, featuring card games like Blackjack all the way to board games like Shoji and Chinese Checkers. The game, if you can even call it one, was just a collection of other games, and obviously did well enough to warrant a follow-up in 2020, also titled Clubhouse Games, but this time, it included 51 worldwide classics. Honestly, I don't really want to rank this higher than it exists, so we'll just leave it there for now. It should probably be in life support, or just not exist in the first place. So one of the more tragic declines I've seen comes at the expense of this next franchise, Chibi Robo. First released in 2005 for the GameCube, Chibi Robo Plug-In Adventure had Chibi Robo game's silent protagonist clean up around the Sanderson's house. As you progress in the game, the platforming would become more challenging due to the short height of Chibi. Initial reception to the game was positive and would urge Nintendo to follow up on it with the release of a further four sequels. Each game would see a decline in sales however, and in a last ditch effort to save the series, Nintendo decided to change the game from a 3D platformer to a 2D platformer in the same vein as a Castlevania game. They also bundled an amiibo character with retail versions of the latest game, Chibi Robo Ziplash. But this did little to save it, as sales were at an all-time low. Many consider the commercial fail of Ziplash to be the final nail in the coffin, as no plans have been discussed regarding future entries. The best-selling Nintendo game ever, well if you could even count it as one, considering that it was packaged with the console it was played on. But Wii Sports was revolutionary in what it was able to do. It was essentially a glorified tech demo to show off the Wii's motion controls, but went on to receive universal acclaim. This would spawn endless amounts of sequels and spin-offs, mainly in terms of party games. Some of the sub-series spawned from Wii Sports included Wii Party, which featured two games, Wii Play, Wii Fit, Wii Chess, and out of all of these, Wii Sports is the only franchise that has continued to be released to this day. Now, I'm not sure if you can count Switch Sports as a sequel, but many consider it to be one. I would say that Wii Sports, or just Nintendo Sports at this point, I don't know what to name it really, but it falls into the It Exists category. The inconsistency in releases makes sure it can't reach mainstay status. Well, can you guess this next franchise based on what you just heard? I'll give you a clue. It starts with Rhythm and ends with Heaven. Wait, fuck. Released in 2006 for the Game Boy Advance, exclusively in Japan, and originally known as Rhythm Tengoku, the game would first test the player with a rhythm test upon starting. Regardless, it would be another three years before the franchise would make it to the Western world. Now formally known as Rhythm Heaven, the game was released in 2009 for the Nintendo DS. Similarly to the original game, Rhythm Heaven featured multiple minigames that were highly unique and required precise timing and rhythm. Players would use the styles to touch and swipe at the right times. The game was praised for its innovative take on the tired minigame genre, and as a result, two more games would be released, Rhythm Heaven Fever for the Wii in 2012, and most recently, Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix for the 3DS in 2016. Unfortunately, the franchise has not seen a new installment since Mega Mix, and at the current rate, 
it's looking dire for the continuation of this beloved series. Have you ever wanted to raise your IQ by 50? Well, this next franchise won't help you with that, but it does involve fun interactive puzzle games that help you better use your brain. Brain Age was the go-to game back in the day, with the original game selling over 19 million copies. The franchise has five games to its name, with the latest release being Dr. Kawashima's Brain Training for the Switch in 2019. As of yet, there has been no NA release for this game, but it did release in EU and AU in 2020. Due to its niche nature, I believe it can't move past it exists though. Now after wiping out most of the real life professional athletes like Tiger Woods and Lionel Messi, Mario thought it, thought it best to take on another franchise, and who better than Sega's Sonic. This has become more of a tradition nowadays, whenever there's the Olympics or Winter Olympics and you can kind of expect a Mario and Sonic game. Is that enough to push it into mainstays? Not really. I would just say it exists and just pops up every 4 years. Now have you ever wanted to go scuba diving but can't swim? Well, have I got just the franchise for you. I introduce you to Endless Ocean, released on the Wii in 2007. The game involves the player exploring the vast ocean while encountering an extensive list of marine life. You can also go cave diving, trench exploring and wreck diving. So pretty much all the most dangerous shit ever without any of the real danger. Sounds fun right? Well enough people thought so to warrant a sequel which was released in 2010 for the Wii. Not sure what happened but since the notion of exploring the sea no longer it seems to interest Nintendo, making for another sunken franchise. The next franchise featured is one of the few that features mystery adventure games. Hotel Dusk is a relatively unknown franchise first released in 2007 for the Nintendo DS. The game had you hold your Nintendo DS sideways and use the touch controls to unlock combination locks and observe other things. The game did receive good ratings and within 3 years a sequel was produced called Last Window, The Secret of Cape West. While never formally released in America, EU received the game months after Japan and since then no mentions of the franchise have been made. Honestly I have no idea what this franchise is nor how it's managed to release 4 games, but from what I can tell it's a fashion game series where the player must operate a boutique and coordinate outfits. You can also compete in contests to become the stylist champion. What's surprising is that this game was the best selling game in Japan of any format on release. As a result, the game would receive 3 sequels up until 2017 with Style Savvy Styling Star. Due to the games being exclusive released on handheld consoles, it's hard to say whether a future game will be made. Considering each new installment results in lower sales than the last, I would consider it pretty much on life support if not dead. Fossil Fighters was first introduced in 2008 for the Nintendo DS. The central concept of the game was the revival of prehistoric fossils which would turn into supernatural forms known as vivosaurs. Using their elemental energy, the player would use them to engage in combat with other vivosaurs. The game would receive a mixed review, with groups like IGN shitting on it, calling it a Pokemon ripoff. Even so, the franchise would see the inclusion of a further two games, and Fossil Fighters Champions released for the Nintendo DS in 2011, and most recently Fossil Fighters Frontier for the 3DS in 2015. The franchise never took off however, and after receiving mixed reception three times, it seems Nintendo's pulled the plug on it, quickly making a name for itself as one of the greatest ARPG franchises ever. Xenoblade Chronicles first appeared on the Wii in 2011. The game follows the story of Shulk and his ability to use the Monado. The game was praised for its open world aspects and unique gameplay that allowed for movement during fights. The game would sell relatively well and push Nintendo to task Monolith Soft with making more games. Over the last decade, the franchise has seen the release of a further 3 Xenoblade Chronicles games, with the latest being released very recently in the form of Xenoblade Chronicles 3. While still a fairly new and niche franchise, with each new addition the fanbase grows. If it continues on this trajectory, and with the new series the team have in store, then I'm sure it will make a spot for itself in Nintendo's mainstays. For now though, due to the lower sales and niche genre, it will remain in the It Exists tier. Fluidity is one of the few successful pitches to Nintendo from an outside company that resulted in them publishing the game. Released exclusively on the Wii Wear Shop in 2010, the game had the player twisting and tilting their Wii remote to use various forms and properties of water to solve problems and defeat enemies. While there are no official sales records, the original game must have sold decently well to ensure a sequel. Fluidity Spin Cycle was released in 2012 on the 3DS shop, but due to extremely poor sales, it's unlikely that the franchise will ever see the light of day again. Now interestingly enough, this franchise was initially planned and teased as a tech demo for the Nintendo DS in 2004. After many years, the franchise would be revived and formally released in 2011 for the 3DS. Using the touchscreen, players would be met with what was made to look like the control panel of a submarine. 
The goal was to direct submarines through several different ocean locations. Each level featured multiple paths one could choose, as well as enemies that fired missiles. The game received poor reviews, leading to the release of a free-to-play sequel in 2014 titled Steel Diver Sub Wars. While faring better in the eyes of critics than compared to the first game, it was obvious following the game's release that this franchise was most likely never going to surface again. Made up of entirely digital games, Pushmo is a series of puzzle games for the 3DS and Wii U. Released in 2011 for the 3DS, the game featured a relatively simple gameplay mechanic that involved the player pushing and pulling blocks in a structure to climb up and rescue a child. Three follow-up games were released all digitally in 2012, 2014 and 2015. That marks the end of the franchise though it seems, as no new games have been announced or teased since. Now technically with this franchise, Nintendo doesn't own the full rights, at least not to the original game that was released in 2009 for the PS3 and Xbox 360. After the release of Bayonetta 2 in 2014 for the Wii U, and Bayonetta 3 in 2022 for the Switch, Nintendo does in fact hold the rights, so I thought it would be best to include them in this list. For the most part, Bayonetta has become a particularly popular franchise within its niche. The game sold poorly on the Wii U due to the lackluster sales of the console, but recently Bayonetta 3 has managed to sell over 1 million copies. I don't believe it's anywhere near big enough to work its way into the mainstays, but due to the continued support from Nintendo and the upcoming prequel Bayonetta's Origins to be released this year, I think it won't be needing life support for a while at least. Now everyone's favourite genre is back with the puzzle games. Box Boy was a series of puzzle platformers that was released primarily for the Nintendo 3DS. First featured in 2015, the game featured, well, a box boy named QB. Now QB had the ability to spawn boxes from his body that he would use to traverse the 173 challenges before him. Each world would often introduce a new feature and the concepts would rarely be reused. This unique take on puzzle solving was praised by critics, leading to the release of a further three games. The most recent entry was Box Boy plus Box Girl, which was released for the Nintendo Switch in 2019. This game, as you can probably guess, introduced co-op play, allowing two players to play as QB and QC. Considering the franchise is still in its infancy, but has managed to release four games over such a short time span, I think it's safe to have it in the It Exists tier, for now. I don't think it reaches the same number of eyes as mainstays though. We have now arrived at the latest and the most recent Nintendo franchise. While not technically the most recent, it is the most recent one that has had multiple games put into it. Splatoon exploded onto the scene in 2015 for the Wii U, and since then has only continued to grow. A team-based action shooter, the game received positive reviews, with players finding the unique take on the shooter genre refreshing and fun to play. Featuring a multitude of weapons and maps, the game had you splashing the map with ink and marking it as your territory. Teammates could then use this ink to transform into a squid and travel twice as fast as normal. In its lifetime, the game would sell close to 5 million copies, which was monumental on a system that only managed to sell 13 to 14 million units as a whole. This would result in two sequels fittingly named Splatoon 2 in 2017, and recently Splatoon 3 in 2022, both for the Switch. The popularity of the series has skyrocketed since, with both Splatoon 2 and 3 selling well over 10 million copies. At this rate, it could very well become a Nintendo flagship, which is even more impressive given its age. For now though, due to the small number of games released, I think it still belongs in the mainstays category. And there you have it, that's the final list. Uh, do whatever you want with it, you can share it, you can roast it, you can show it to your mum even, or even make your own. This is just what I believe the current state of each Nintendo franchise is. But if there's one thing that Nintendo does well, it's that it makes such a large variety of games that anybody, regardless of age, gender, nationality, or beliefs, can enjoy. Now I hope you guys enjoyed this video, um, obviously it kind of took a lot out of me, but I appreciate you especially if you stayed this long into the video to hear me drivel on at this stage. Please consider subscribing if you enjoyed and I'll catch you all in the next one.